for environmental concerns. They are the bottom line, as water can sequester a lot of CO2 when it is healthy. And of course, water is also a vital food source of great importance. We are members of the Green Party, where our principles are based on Titanism, including honoring Tikana. I'm presently studying Te Reo at the Te Pou Manako in Kerikeri, where Tikanga is a large part of the curriculum. And I'm in awe of what we are learning there. Personally, I have many years of project management experience, the first and most difficult ones forming and managing two joint ventures in the north of China, introducing German technology in textile production, followed then by a jig and joint, jig and fixer joint venture in Malaysia for the car industry. So I am well, well familiar with plants and their organization and working with the people involved who are the basis of success for any of such ventures. Here in New Zealand, I have chosen to look at wastewater issues in Northland and participated in an extramural course with Professor Susan Kremlik of Canterbury on transition engineering, a field that she has started. And this deals with wicked problems. That means problems that cannot be solved with old methods, but where new methods are considered when it is not feasible to use the old ones for diverse reasons. And that brings us to the wastewater issues in Oponomi and Koko. In our submission, we have raised numerous reasons to object to the Council's application to extend the expired wastewater treatment plant consents with the suggested improvements. Based on what we have witnessed so far, we trust that these reasons have been read attentively and it follows for us that the application needs to be rejected. We object to the disposal of wastewater effluents to rivers, lakes and the sea. It is necessary to maintain the CO2 sequestering properties of water and providing aquatic life recovery in the Hokianga. As we've read and heard uh, with the many contributions, this will also hopefully help to solve and heal many of the sorrows that have been inflicted here. We have read and listened to the contributions from Council's representatives and experts. While the effects of ingress of more or less clean wastewater and the monitoring has really been very, very negligent. While these effects have been described as minor, mostly based on desktop research, which was questions very much by Roger before here, with very little consistent locally acquired data. It was stated by Dr. Dada, for example, that the shellfish in the end should not be eaten. Fish, shellfish and kinna are a very important food source which must be kept safe as the highest priority. This is the background for the corresponding tikana and definitely not putting any wastewater remnants into the waterways. On no account can this be outweighed by financial considerations. This is really the bottom line that we see in all of this. Financial considerations cannot outweigh extinguishing food sources in the end, and we are very close to this here. <coughs> These financial considerations, or even priorities, are based on the assumption that land discharge, as desired by the population, is too expensive. Another reason given is that the clay soil does not absorb water discharge sufficiently. These conditions are of course existent in other locations as well, where methods have been found to clean the water to food safe status, so it can be used for irrigation and fertilization. 
These are proven and patented processes. Surplus irrigation water is stored in reservoirs for use during drought times, which is a possibility for the Hopian drought process as well. Speaking from a financial point of view, and this is our expertise in some aspects, we are frankly amazed that for wastewater plants for communities as small as only 200 people or even 600 people, very large amount of ratepayers' money have been paid for consultants over many years, and these are tens of thousands of dollars, and no improvement is visible. A lot of desktop research has been done, but local involvement and inclusions in looking for solutions seem to have been disregarded to a very large extent, in spite of the fact that the knowledge is here and it has been amply demonstrated. As it has been mentioned several times, we need a solution to the pro a problem of wastewater removal that observes Tikana, thus preventing aquatic life as a food resource from being extinguished. In accordance with transition engineering, it is better to think of wastewater, by the way, as a never-ending resource, which it is indeed. And, by the way, in Japan, they use it as payment for rents until the Americans came about after the Second World War. One of the solutions is more than 100 years old proven system of electric coagulation. Effective elimination of bacteria and viruses, phosphates and nitrates, using small amounts of electricity, some iron substrates, some vinegar, and oops, your uncle has heard Mungo would have said. The chemical process of electrocution with iron plates eliminates algae as well, by the way, but this is definitely not the only purpose of it, as has been mentioned by one of the experts. The electro-pure coagulation process was patented in Germany in 1906 by a guy called Mr. Dietrich, and it was then, because it was so successful, also patented in America in 1909. It has been and is being used worldwide, mostly for industrial wastewater now. In all those places where it's being used are easily traceable through, for example, ChatGPT. It prints out pages and pages and pages of where it has been used or is being used. It has in Germany even been used to clean the 30 years ago extremely polluted Lake of Constance. And in that project, our local scientist here, Andreas Kobold, was involved. Here in Northland, said Andreas Kuhlmann, the scientist from Switzerland, was in charge, no, <laughs> the guy here was in charge of 40 wastewater stations in Switzerland. 40 wastewater stations. So he is really someone who knows his stuff. His patient explanations here were so convincing to us that 18 months ago we installed the DC wastewater treatment plant at our small Papakainga or retreat in Kerry Kerry with five little houses, bed one bedroom houses, so that we could demonstrate that we could further improve the effluent of an old, very well consented, large, large septic tank. Our AC unit has now been in use for over a year and we are monitoring it very closely. We are recording those data, flow uh, data and power consumption. And we have explained it in a little leaflet in very simple terms of what we are doing and what can be observed. We have no monetary interest in that. We have paid privately for that for the setup of that plant. But we felt it was important to have something close to council 
that can be observed, and Omeya has been there already, um, so that it can be seen in operation and it cannot be considered a lab laboratory experiment, mm -hmm. as it has been said in one of the experts' documents. Mm -hmm. Our unit, for example, for uh, on average 10 people present, produces about 0 0.6 cubic meters or 600 liters of food safe irrigation water every day. Food safe for us is very important, and this is why we cherish what Andreas and his laboratory can do. Um, if it is not food safe, we could just as well forget it, it would not be <coughs> any help. That water we have uh, connected to irrigation lines, which are drip feeding in our about 220 square meter raised garden beds. And we are using the approximately 20 liters of liquid fertilizer that the system produces, which are also certified food safe, as to where it is needed. The power consumption is about 5 kilowatt hours per day for an operation time of about 2 hours per day, which is all that is needed with these 10 people using it. The equipment, which was uh, had a cost of about 30k in total, um, can handle 70 people's uh, water consumption and uh, production. Then it would be working 24 hours. So these five uh, kilowatt hours per day are coming from solar panels. Our place is totally supplied with uh, solar energy. 63 panels producing about 13.5 kilowatt, uh, kilowatts per day. Yeah. So these small or some small EC units are, by the way, also working in Manganui, Cable Bay and in other places in New Zealand. The system can be upscaled to any size. Um, the EC unit works fully automated and can be monitored off-site by cell phone. This is really important to the large distances that we have here in the far north. Um, you need to have somewhere where you have a more or less hourly record of what is going on. So if mechanical help is necessary, somebody can set, be sent that very quickly. And by the way, I would like to mention again, FNDC is about to install EC units in Ramini and another one in Taipa. The numerous, numerous small northern communities, and they are small, and this is why I think large companies are not so interested in uh, coming up with alternative solutions for what is able to be done here. All these communities here need low cost, easy to maintain, systems that are pathogen removing, meaning bacteria and viruses and medical uh, remnants, etc. We cannot, I think, rely here on systems that need long distance advice or uh, where the design was done in Newcastle or somewhere. Um, and we cannot have systems here that need excessive financing. Small systems that can be financed with budgets of one year or something because they are just in addition to existing systems. You see, can be added to any system that is existing here before you relocate it, etc. Um, this is why we, we think EC systems, as Andreas has researched and suggested, may be the best solution here that can be immediately installed, more or less immediately. I mean, if you do, you do need half a year or three quarters of a year to get all the stuff here, but that it can work. And they are easy to install and, and maintain. The monitoring uh, stories we have listened to with uh, great concern, uh, looking at a bottom line approach. This is how we have worked in our uh, professional lives, you look at what, what is the outcome of it. What we see is daily monitoring needs to be done locally, by locally empowered people. For example, when you do water monitoring, we have done this with the Kerry Kerry River, 
You need to see what happens right after the storm. You need to be there. You need to get your water sample to the lab within 10 hours. Uh, with the distances we have here, that is um, not, not efficient if you try to do it a month after the effect or something like that. <coughs> we urge you to follow the requests of the local Kaitiaki and Kaimahi to stop discharging wastewater into the Hokianga immediately. Do not wait for very long times. Add EC systems to what you have now, and you can discharge to land. You can discharge into lakes that are being dug with excavated very quickly, basically, and you have something for the upcoming droughts, and we'll have them. Please do not extend the resource concerns for such long periods of time. So the old problems with new methods will be financially beneficial, beneficial and satisfy our rate-paying people, as well as honoring the tikanga that has been broken and disregarded for so many years. Yeah. Wolf will say something about it, unless you want to ask me. Yeah, maybe, yeah, ask your questions first. Okay. I'll take the first I'm Wolf, one of the trustees, uh, and um, also deputy chair of Vision Kiri Kiri, another community group, um, for which both of us have been working for about 15 years. 15 years of countless submissions to council, to FNDC as well as NRC, um, trying to be as objective and supportive uh, of methods. And we have all, also always approved the highest level of rate increases that have been requested by both FNDC and NRC to improve their services as they had outlined unnecessary to have more staff to do all those things that are necessary. Um, however, may I say at this point, not really to our satisfaction. The water quality in the Hokianga and in the rivers of Northland is totally unacceptable. We have, as Inge mentioned, been testing the water of the Kerikeri River because uh, we were annoyed by a sign um, by FNDC, a joint sign of FNDC and NRC, that um, the river is not suitable for swimming. And that in the Stone Store Basin, where we have a lot of tourists coming and um, they would like to use their leisure time to enjoy the waters. So now, in the meantime, because of our complaints and because we told them this is not appropriate and that refers to the Hong Kianga uh, just the same, uh, they have removed the sign, signs, uh, and explained to me that they have now upgraded, up, up, uh, set up a website which informs people um, whether the water is swimmable or not which is totally ridiculous. I mean, it's good to have that information at, at hand on the website, but which tourist, which kid is checking the website before going to swim? So this is totally unacceptable. Regarding the wastewater treatment plants uh, here in, uh, at the Hokianga, um, I think FNDC's failures have been sufficiently outlined and scolded by the community in this meeting already. This is nothing personal to the representatives of FNDC, of course, but um, I think it is unbelievable. And the same uh, applies actually for NRC. NRC's job is to monitor, control, and uh, consent whatever FNDC is uh, applying that they need to do for seven, respectively, four years of expired wastewater treatment plants. This is totally <laughs> unbelievable and incomprehensible. Uh, that means NRC has totally failed its responsibilities. Again, nothing personal, uh, but um, <coughs> this cannot go on. Obviously, we don't want NRC to be in the 
in the need of suing FNDC uh, because that would mean that we as ratepayers are paying two times <laughs> plus the penalty. So that doesn't work. I hope that the commissioners are able and successful in ensuring that both councils will be doing the necessary in the future. Uh, we have heard from you repeatedly uh, what, your, what limitations you have as commissioners and obviously we are aware that after this hearing and after having made your report to NRC, you are going to disappear and uh, I just hope very much that you will, before you disappear, uh, relay as much as possible from all that valuable advice that you have received from the community. Uh, advice and opinions and disappointment and uh, unbelief really uh, that it is not getting lost. Uh, as we see no senior staff is available here. The mayor has been here um, uh, as we heard uh, supporting the community rather than staff uh, but it's disappointing I think that no senior staff is interested in this apparently. Uh, we understand that um, the, the, um, there's always a lack of staff, and a lack of time, a lack of resources, but for something that has been going on for seven, uh, well, since the expiry, I mean, obviously the process must have been started much earlier than that, as we have heard already before as well. So um, this is really surprising, and I hope that you will relay this uh, disappointment to the respective councils as well. Um, in regard to the uh, EC um, that has been mentioned now by various people and which we are experiencing at uh, our uh, retreat um, for one and a half years already, um, the point that is necessary to make is that the outcome of that plant is clean. There's no nothing bad in it in it, in it at more, uh, anymore at all. So the water that's coming out is very valuable irrigation water. Councils don't need to buy land in order to supply and maybe even sell clean food safe waste, uh, sorry irrigation water <laughs> um, which can be used in forest, it can be used in orchards, it can be used in, well, in, in our garden we use, uh, use it to grow vegetables, uh, which is not according to Maori liking, uh, we understand, so it's not necessary, but, so for example, in Kuhu Kuhu, where the wastewater at the plant is coming out of septic tanks, same as at our system, um, the, the uh, water that's coming out then can easily be put on those too few identified pieces of land that were mentioned. Uh, even if there's an occasional overflow when there is heavy rain, the water is clean. So if it does not disappear in the ground immediately, it does not matter. It's the same as rain. Uh, and uh, by the time uh, some of it runs into the Hokianga, it, it, time has passed and it's mixed with rainwater, so it does not really matter. And the other thing is um, the fertilizer that's coming out of it, uh, in our case about 20 liters per day, uh, in a wastewater treatment plant obviously much more. It's uh, being done in the plant in Manganui. There's a, there's a big container and now farmers are coming to take this fertilizer and pay for it. So irrigation water can be sold and fertilizer can be sold in order to pay for the operations, operational costs. So it's a real benefit. There might be other, other systems available, but this EC system just strikes us as a, as a no-brainer. Uh, so, um, so just repeat, we hope and expect you to deny the consent for this unacceptable uh, new application. Uh, we agree, <coughs> well, we have to agree because there's no choice to extend the existing um, uh, system for a short period of time because obviously there's no alternative. 
uh, with strict conditions to improve it immediately and uh, this needs to be enforced by NRC and that gives then the time for council to come up with uh, a new application which meets the expectations of everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So this morning I would like to talk to you about the submission that was received from Te Mare o Te Wai, which was a collective effort and reflected um, the concerns and issues that um, had been represented and voiced in, in our group as a part of our ongoing um, modus operandi, I suppose. And modus operandi brings me to the point, and I think this will be the thing. So this morning I'd like to uh, not necessarily go through that submission, I'm, I'm going to take it as read. Would that be appropriate? Yeah, no, that's fine. Just mm -hmm. because I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm very conscious that some people in the hallway, and I'm just wondering whether there are any that seem to come out of the hallway that we could create another row. Oh, I think. Oh, come in front. I've got some seats up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, all of you in the hall that might want to seat. There's more seats over here, and there's some here. There's one over here, by the way. You're still out of my spitting distance, so you're safe. Work close for me, Dave. <laughs> insisted on, I want to make that point again, it includes estuarine areas. 
It's not just about punawai. And it's really, really, really clear, actually. And I just want to read that because some of our community, our whānau here, were like, oh, no, we thought that applied. You know, now we know it doesn't. And I was like, no, 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 don't just listen to what people say. That is the response. And I know this might seem hard. But actually, when you are the convener in one of the Hapukai Kai or on a community liaison group, and you sit in a room and hear an applicant discuss, is it of value and is there purpose? I have to say, you've got that's a gloves off moment, guys. <laughs> that's a gloves off moment. When you are the convener and one of many hapu on a community liaison group that have worked and committed yourself for years and years, and I'm a baby in it. I'm sitting beside a woman who's been doing it for more than 40 years, and Uncle Patu his whole life, not to mention my mother. She is a fierce defender of it. So when you sit there and you hear that reason, is there a purpose? And there are little in, you know, innuendos around dysfunction, you know, sort of almost aim there, but it's a little dysfunctional. It's not dysfunctional. If I was to talk to you about how many times staff members have changed roles working with our community liaison group, te mauri o te wai, we could sit here all day. There's a whole whakapapa of staff that we have dealt with and worked with and worked earnestly with and had some joys with too. But that was our gloves off moment on Monday for us as a community. And I don't make any apology for saying that, just like that. When you're sitting in a room and you look around and you see, yes, it's me sitting here talking, but I didn't miss the expressions on the faces of a kaumatua and queer that were part of these groups, the anguish on their face. This is the role of us in my generation, is to get up and speak up so that the kaumatua and queer of our generation, of our, of our lifetime, don't have to suffer the indignity of speaking up for themselves. That is a part of our role as kai kōrero, to get out in the front, to send the hips out, right? Because in the time that they sit there and express how it's quite costing, it's quite, you know, like you could tell that, the, that they feel like it's quite hard for them. Have they ever considered how hard it is for Komatua and queer to go to council office? To fill out a submission form? You know, how many people were wahanu, unable to express themselves in a submission form? There is no empathy for that. Or if there is, it is insufficient because their empathy was not sufficient enough to warrant them to respect the fact that relationship is valuable and actually, according to the law, multiple times over, despite the presence of one who generally is required. I'm not going to bore you with the statutes that I know you already know, but I just want to point out there's a list about as long as that roll of toilet paper that flowed across the floor that reference the obligation of Crown organisations to pay he and have relationship in multiple different ways to hapu and iwi and community. And that brings us to this point here. If I was to think about giving my child permission to drive a car, I would consider how many times they've crashed. If you are licensing a person to drive and they have crashed every damn day for the last 10 years, you're going to ask yourself. You've got to send them on some defensive driving courses, guys, because this cannot continue. I've taken what they're crashing into. The mori of our way. The mana of our people. If I was to ask the people in this room to please stand up if you fuck up up or two, or derive your identity from the word hokianga will stand up. If you if you to hokianga and you're in this room, or you derive your identity from it because you live here and are connected, please stand up, Fano. Everybody here derives their identity in some way from hokianga. 
And every day that is the receiving environment for 190 10 ton trucks of treated wastewater, sometimes not treated. Thank you, Fano. So if we come back to this, I want to highlight really what we show in our submission, which goes through and lists. If you think that was a stunt, it's not. It's an opportunity for the people who came here to participate in the process because they are wahangu by the submission process. In that small act, they were given permission to take part in something, to give voice with their bodies. When you use your cell phone and you're on social media and you're in funny situations, you know when you've been hanging out in the wrong crowd because the algorithm changes, right? The algorithm is like, girl, I know what you want. I know who you've been around. The algorithm of my cell phone is an indicator to me of what I have been shown interest in. And when you look at the evidence that has been submitted by the applicant, you start to get an idea of their algorithm. There is an algorithm at play here. There is a modus operandi which demonstrates their commitment and the cycles and the repeated trends in their behaviours. When they think about the experts, they don't think about our experts. When they think about doctorates and people that have doctorates, they haven't even considered ours. In fact, I have seen in council meetings that they have discounted ours for want of a conflict because they have a vested interest. So I would submit to you both that the very people who know the most about this water have been removed from the pool of acceptable experts. Isn't that extraordinary that people who live here and are observing and are qualified, he looked at the Maori, he looked at the Pākehā, and these things are discounted from being able to provide evidence. That is a fact. So what you get is desktop studies. The consultation that has taken place including the, the, the cultural impact assessments, it's not, it's questionable. It was really frustrating. We had a hui here, Te Mauro Te Wai meets, and it was difficult through COVID, but through, you know, I'm in here for Zoom. Anyway, we had a public hui here in this hall, and the person writing the cultural impact assessment was here. They didn't tell us they were here for that reason. So we're here talking about that our Winnie Wastewater Treatment Plant with the wider community, and at the same time, we have regular meetings, sometimes irregular, especially in COVID, but we have regular meetings, and we are, as a community, in regular, constant contact with each other through lots of different settings. And then Every year we have a public hui. The purpose of that public hui is to share key messages, to educate our whānau, hapu community about wastewater systems, anything, you know, pāmaki te wai, anything to do with wai. And sometimes, and we've had also ones where we had different experts come and talk about different types of systems so that our communities could see them question those experts themselves, independent experts. And at that meeting, uh, she's come in, she's listened, and of course, other communities, including whānau from Kōhukohu, including whānau from Opanuni, came along, because we're all actually related. This is the point. I don't think they realise sometimes you go over here to this CLG and you have a yarn, and they're shocked when we know what's happened there because they're our aunties and uncles. You know, we're all related. So that CIA comes out, and you can imagine our dismay when we see things in there that have been taken right out of context and applied across an inappropriate scope. Well and the whānau from Upanoni and Omāpere and the whānau from Kohukohu and both are saying, we weren't talking about that. 
We were not talking about that. We were talking about something else. Also, there's another thing going on here too. And this is more for the, the appeasement of the two nannies who were in my ear last night saying, you have to say it back. <laughs> this is a part of what it's like to be a Kai Kōrero on behalf of an orku that represents the community, right? They were upset. Here in the room, we also have women here who play rugby. My niece plays rugby, my nieces, cuz, my cousins. They play for the Hokianga women's rugby. Their field is right beside the Kohu Kohu wastewater treatment plant. You might have seen it, the Water Kohu rugby ground. <laughs> Last week, that rugby ground completely flooded. It's not an uncommon occurrence. And it's where this rugby team is based. They then host a home game. My niece comes home to me and she says, Oh man, that boy smelled paru. It smelled like tiko. Auntie, we've got to do something about that. It's not, is it having an impact on the receiving environment? And that is not negligible. That is my niece playing in a way that smells hunger. And is Honga. And I felt myself lying to her. That was a lie. It wasn't really, it was like a, an unspoken, you know, a truth that was slid to the side. That's how I told myself it's okay, I was unto you. Oh, honey, it probably wasn't. Truth is, it blimmin' well was. And we know it was because the auntie went down to photograph it. Not that long ago, too, only two years ago, the stock banks around that wastewater treatment plant all subsided and were breached. And there were, there were photos of that. There are multiple examples of this kind of thing happening. So when we sit here on Monday and I see the anguish and the anger on the people in the room because they are listening, some, as someone says, from a desktop study based on monitoring samples, that are only taken once a month on who knows what phase of the maramataka at what time of the time, which is all really, really, really relevant to us, right? So if we're doing observations, you go on the same phase of the maramataka in order to get comparative results. That is a part of the methodology that must be adhered to according to our ecological observation standards, iro te te ao Māori. You don't go on a huna day and then go back on a tangaroa kyokyo day and say, wow, look at the transformation. I'm telling you, on the huna phase, they're all huna. <laughs> Everything hides away. Tangaroa kyokyo, not only are they there, but they're brazen. Everything. Pātiki, tuna, waraka at the night time, pūkeko, kiori, they're all out. So you want to measure the, the mauri of a place. The key time to do that tiro tiro is tangaroa kyo kyo. And the team key period to be out there is from taifanaki to te parino o te tai and then just past to tai pa. From the half tide coming in to the turning of the full tide and just after. Those are the key four to six hour period that we would accept. If you're not doing that consistently, every single Maramata phase, you know, circuit of the maramataka, cycle of the lunar phase, your data, as far as we're concerned, doesn't meet the L standard of expectation in terms of excellence. We too have standards. So if you tell me they've taken four, one sample, I see actually in the conditions, eh, they're proposing no less than one sample every four months. <laughs> At random times, that wouldn't, we would be ridiculed in our peers, amongst our peers, amongst other maramataka practitioners. That would be nowhere near it. You have to record the phase of the maramataka, what the tides are doing, ngā tohu o te rangi, me te whenua, me te moana. And this is just for our beginning practitioners. They haven't even begun to illuminate the taxonomic hierarchy which is present, which we call whakapapa. 
So, when we look at monitoring, when we consider the flawed uh, attitude towards community liaison, relationship building and consultation, when we consider the fact that independent engineers and experts have excluded expertise that live here and have got extensive data available to them at their fingertips. One came in just three days ago. Taipanake, to te parangō te tai, tangaroa a kio kio, ono here, the location, all the observations come in, they're constantly coming in. When you think about the fact that we have heard extensively about dilution and negligible effects, I just want to show something so the applicant and all of our whanau will understand why. You heard my example yesterday. So I've got here why dilution is not acceptable. So here we have water, two bowls of water, and let's pick red, because it's obvious. So let's go for <coughs> one drop. I'm just going to use my finger because we're Māori. <laughs> Kapai. There it is. We can all see there's waste in this water. Oh, sorry. Chong. We're not drinking that. There's tickle in it. Which I put my finger in, which is now alarming. <laughs> Damn it, I shouldn't have put my finger in. One drop. Actually, that was a tiny little bit more, so I better do it there. Sorry. I just put another drop in there because it was like one and a half drops in there, and I don't want to be like a rude guy. So now this has been diluted and mixed very expertly with my finger. But if that was tickle, you still wouldn't drink it. Hey. Is this okay to drink? It looks a lot lighter, right? I can see that it's diluted. I can see that it's mixed. And definitely, it's okay. But I'll tell you what, if it's tickle, it's still not okay. I'm not feeding that to my kids. And the reason why we're not feeding it to our kids is because it doesn't take into consideration te tapu or te tanata. That's really the key consideration there. So absolutely, even if you can't see it, there's still, we know it's in there. That's the point. That is the point. So dilution and mixing, and I don't think I need to go on too much more about that because you've heard lots about it, right? But I just wanted to say that What's not demonstrated there is the smell. When you drove here this morning, no doubt you would have smelled that I want a waste water treatment plant. Yeah. Did you? I've got a cold. Oh! <laughs> Commissioner Crawford, did you smell? No, I didn't. Well, make sure you wind the window down on your way back. He gave me the cold. Oh, it's <laughs> not The point is here that you can see it when you drive past, and I know that's not that one, but if you go up to the others, you will <coughs> smell it. My niece smelled it all over her legs and her body at rugby training and during the rugby game. You can see it. You know it's there. You can smell it. And I want to make a point here. When people say that the impact on the receiving environment is negligible, that is because it's not their mana being called into account when they serve kaimoana up from Hukiana. When we were little children, we would hear stories about the recipes that our grandparents would make. How they would go on their waka up around to tote to ihi ihi and around those ways and they'd get this. How they would go all the way down on their cart, horse and cart, dragged cart, one of our kani was, down there to gather a gar, you know, like rimu. Yeah. 
They don't do those anymore. Some people still do, but you know why? Because they gather that particular rimurimu, which is by whale here, for rumua. But that can no longer be used for rumua because it has got tiko in it, human waste, which makes it no longer acceptable to use for rumua because it would be an offence to the tapu of that person. Right? Over here at Tote Ihi Ihi Marae, where they would go together, other, amongst lots of things, a karahu, flounder, there's a shellfish that gather on those, that, you know, like, and, you know what karahu are? Mm. Those little, um, what's that? Snails. 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 Like a mangrove snail, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know the name of the name. Yeah, karahu. But you can't serve that up. That used to be a specialty kai for kaimatua and kuya in particular because it's nice and soft and they're small bites and they're good to cook. Fry them up in a little bit of butter. Yum. And we can't anymore. Even if it was tested before, everybody knows that here, there, there, and definitely down the wema awa comes human waste. So the reputation and, and definitely the edibility of those things have been denigrated. I want to touch to on the fact that we had elected representatives speaking. We had councillors on behalf who represent the governing body of the applicant speaking in opposition to this application for resource consent, supported by the mayor. I'm, I'm asking, I don't know, and I, please don't ask it, it's a hypothetical question, but in my mind, I'm trying to understand how does that look and sit in a legal framework when the governing body of the applicant is sitting and standing and speaking in opposition of themselves, effectively. They weren't just standing in opposition of the group that they are the governing body of, they were standing with the community. Yeah. And I think that that's a really important thing to point out. Two of them are newly elected. So these, this algorithm that I am touching on and this modus operandi is clearly something they were elected and are wanting to influence change to. And I think that that is what you are seeing. I think that we are not in fact seeing, seeing uh, a council who is not, the council themselves, the councillors can see that we are applying for something that we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> and I mean, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but they came here and spoke it themselves. So on behalf of Te Māori o Te Wai, and now hapu here no kanga, I just want to acknowledge in particular the apology from Huna Harura Haukiara. Mm. She made a formal apology in her submission to us on behalf of herself and Taku Kauni here as her submission to us and to the Moana. I just want to acknowledge and accept her apology and highlight that is something that I think is deserving of a mention and of and I'm definitely of observation. The locations of these sites are of cultural Sorry, significance. Sorry, I'm um, putting people used to hearing. There's no filming allowed in the hearing, so cameras away, please. I know young people struggle to not film the whole world, but it is happening. Can <laughs> we film it or not? <laughs> so when we come back to this thing about the algorithm, it's what they're doing, they're feeding the algorithm. There's some stuff in there. <laughs> okay, we, I want to talk about the locations, the sites of cultural significance in the landscapes. And I won't go on about it too much because I, I feel like lots of other submitters have touched on the fact that it is significant. And, but I do want to say, the reason I asked about, you know, how was your sleep every night, because I feel like I want you to see, I'm trying to gauge, 
do you see how outstanding the landscapes are here? Even though the sun is not shining, can you not see how you would love this place so passionately? It's such a thing, right? We're in a kind of a pool, but anyway. The point is, it is an outstanding landscape. And I wanted to just highlight another document that I think might help that, that has been recognised on a regional level. And that is that in 2020 or 21, I think NICE is here. When would you first come? When did the board come to Hokkaido? Uh, was it 21? 21. Yeah. In 2021, the Northland Conservation Board came to Hokkaido. And as a result, you'll find on page 8 and 9 that they cite Hokkaido Nui Kupe as a site of significance here in Northland from the Conservation Board. And then it also it reoccurs in the very next paragraph in, on page nine, which talks about conservation concerns in the region. So in one list, it pops up as a site of importance and of note, and then in the very next list, which talks about conservation concerns, and there it says the discharge of treated wastewater into the Hokianga Harbour. Water. In section, oh, hold on, I don't want to go on about section, but in the national policy statement for fresh water, I keep coming back to this because I feel like that Te Mano Te Wai is actually applied and answers a lot of our questions. And that's why I, I would totally refute the idea that that, that that doesn't apply here. It's up to you guys to decide that, but I feel like it definitely does. I remember, I was thinking, how do you explain that? Why is important? And I remembered, I don't know if you can remember that trumpet ad. Do you, do you know the trumpet ice cream? The undies, undies, undies talks? <laughs> it's the same thing, right? Some of us are here saying, oh, ko hokiana te moana, and then my mum gets up here, like, just, just before me, and says, oh, oh awa o hokiana. <laughs> you know, like, for her, it's an awa, because in that day, they saw it as an awa. For me, I'm like, it's a moana, you know, undies, 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 togs. <laughs> At what point does, do the, does a tog turn into a pair of undies? I want to say to you, if you visualise that ad, and it can be quite traumatic, just this sort of lean man walking along in this tiny pair of green undies, slash togs, it's the same man, they're the same things he's wearing, it's just in a different location, it's wearing the same thing, it's the same thing, whether it's here or there, there is nothing that's in between the connection of those living bodies of water. And there is nothing restricting. The water is not left bereft of the life that lives in it. The fish that live in the water in, in the harbour, here in the saline, they 100% out and I go up the river. They are moving between these environments. You cannot treat one environment as though it is separate and cut off from the other. Our fish are migratory and localised all at once. How awesome we are, just like me. <laughs> on my mum's side, I'm from here. On my dad's side, I'm from here. I can go either side. Awesome thing. The point of the undies, undies, tolls, trumpet air, is that it's the same thing. And I, it might seem a little bit sassy, but. There has been a considerable amount of sass in the way that the applicant has rolled out this whole process. When we come together as a community and we're working with independent experts and engineers, I recognise that there are experts. I do, and I want to acknowledge the expertise that the Council has called on to contribute to these reports. But those experts have been limited by the terms of reference under which they were sought. Yeah. Many of the reports and opines that they have offered in their reports have been gauged by the data and the information that they have been supplied with. 
and the monitoring is questionable. So if we have experts that are providing professional opinions based on the data provided to them, and it's a desktop study, you have to question the viability and the validity of what they have provided opinions on. Sort of. Additionally to that, I would offer to you that the SAS comes in the timing of things. There is this unholy rush that takes place leading up to a consent hearing and a consent application. I submit to you both that a consent application should not be the thing that constitutes an understanding of the cultural impact of an activity. It should be cared about all of the time. There's an unholy rush that happens. You know, things get cleaned up, cultural impacts assessments get done, people suddenly have hui, suddenly they've got money for hui. You know? I'm just pointing it out. Applications are made, time takes, you know, ad admittedly, to be fair to the applicant, there's COVID in amongst all of this, right? But we all found ways around that. And I do want to acknowledge for both the applicant and um, in our community that this had some absolutely massive losses in the last month. So by no means am I narrowing down that conversation to the last month or two. When I talk about SAS in the timing, I talk about SAS in the whole timing. Wail here, stream and Awa has got an extraordinary history. There are other people who live there and have lived resident beside that Awa for their whole life. So I'll allow them to tell that story. But it is not a story that is unknown to the rest of us. Go to Ihi Ihi Marae, which is just situated back, you would have seen it if you went to Fukuoku, situated there. Imagine what happens when you have a wastewater treatment plant right out the front of your mind. Imagine what happens when you have a wastewater treatment plant right at the head of the water that supplies, at the, of the river that supplies water to your marae. In, if you think that Rawane escaped it, you, you're wrong. Here in Rawane, and why is this important? I'm not talking about all these, I'm talking about the license you're about to give to a driver that has repeatedly crashed. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a driver that's trying to defin define between undies and togs while they're wearing the same thing the whole time. <laughs> I am talking about a pattern of behaviours of the way that they make decisions and how they evidence and validate their decisions. And out the back of that, I want to highlight the fact that we have not had a lot of time to consider some of the changes in the information that has come through. I need to wrap it up because I'm really going on now. But I do want to say that discharge into the Hukema Harbour is unacceptable. It's unacceptable because there are evidenced, trialled, re researched, trialled, costed and evidenced alternatives that have come through a process born out of a community liaison group that has worked, that has included the applicant. Yes, it is applicable to another wastewater treatment plant, but actually the point is that information, which is relative to what they're doing in other communities, and actually I want to point out, some of the people in Te Māori or Te Wai are also in those other community liaison groups. I think that's the point. <laughs> really? <laughs> so you can't sort of separate that information out. And as we've worked as a community liaison group, we've taken into consideration the fact that we are aware of these other resource consenting issues that are going on with these other plants. So there are alternatives, and they have not been properly investigated, including land sites. And this is the point, not only have they not been properly investigated, but the investigation changes considerably depending on the type of treatment that comes before a discharge. 
So when they go to investigate potential land sites that are appropriate for discharge to land and they're talking about coming out of a system that people all know because they've seen can often discharge raw and barely treated wastewater, that is a serious conversation to be having. Will you accept that onto your land? Mm. As opposed to, here is the proposed type of treatment, this is it, what it looks like, it comes out, you can see that it's clean. Actually, that's a different conversation altogether. Asking someone if they want water that has come through, uh, that has been sanitised through a proper treatment system that they can see with their own eyes and asking someone if they'll have raw sewerage dumped on their whenua are two very different conversations. Yeah. And in fact, the suitability <coughs> of the land also becomes a very different conversation. Yeah. So when I think about have alternative land sites being properly investigated, I think that that's a really important part to think about. What has that investigation considered? Desktop studies. What were the desktops? Don't forget desktop studies based on what's being absorbed here. Raw sewage, treated sewage, or totally treated to the point where it's sanitised water. Because in fact, the conversation that Te Māori or Te Waia had changed from, oh, what kind of drip feed, we need a bush somewhere, we can have, you know, we've gone the whole journey. Including, remember, people from these other communities. And so we took it, thinking about the whole catchment in point. And then we get to the point where we finally find treatment that the community as a whole supports through a public plea that was held here in this hall. They say, that's the one we like. We pursue that technology, and then the conversation's different because we say, hey guys, does anyone around here need irrigation? Oh, we do. Very different conversation. So when we say alternative land sites have not been properly investigated, I think that, that, that I wanted to make that really clear. The kind of conversation changes according to the type of treatment because what's being discharged is very different. I think the other thing that's very relevant in terms of um, the investigation of alternative land sites is that it has been based on their knowledge and their connections so land that would be available for a community conversation or conversation between whānau is a very different thing. If a council car pulls up to your gate, some of our aunties are not going to invite you in. But if a niece or a nephew pulls up to your gate, oh, I'm fine, I'm like, I'll come out with boy. <laughs> like that's how it is. To demonstrate the power of the importance of the CLG I don't know that you could get yes. a better demonstration of that. Yes. We, ourselves, one to another, open doors to each other. There is such low trust in the council and local government authorities that those doors are closed. So in order to get a community-led solution, those liaison and relationship building structures are vital, absolutely vital. And yes, they can be uncomfortable for council staff. I challenge right back at that though, saying nobody shows a lot of empathy to our community and our whānau when we come in. We shunt it around and push through a thing that prints out a label like we go into a shop and slap it on us and we go in, you know, we get labelled, <laughs> literally, we get shunted in the back, show when we sit down, all these kinds of things. So I think that the shoe's on each other's foot there, and I think it's only fair. One of the key things that we negotiated through the conditions with Te Māori or Te Mai was that every meeting, unless for some reason the Māori wasn't able to host the meeting themselves, was to be held at Te Piti Marae Mo Manaia. That was an intentional and purposeful move and was the thing that I drove hardest for. There was a reason for that, because if it's on the marae, tikanga presides, the taumata presides. And I knew that that single move on its own will single-handedly ensure that the decisions that take place for that group will happen in te ao Māori. So even though there were other things in there, that was a powerful and important thing, because it meant that even though the council holds that, in, that position of authority of power, 
when it comes to they see that it's them being the owner operator of that wastewater treatment plant in that meeting, the community and tikanga Māori holds the power. And it doesn't mean, though, that that's poorly used. Because there's a, there's a responsibility under tikanga to manaki manuhiri, to manaki tangata. But it also means that the bullying that you can sometimes be subjected to, and I'm definitely not in that respect just talking about the staff members who have been involved with these wastewater treatment plants and ourselves. I'm talking about systemic bullying from a system. That, that doesn't happen if we have it on our mind. The treaty principles have not been taken into account. And the cultural effects cannot be avoided. Remedy or mitigated if it's going into all time. There is a portable to we call about Moana Tui Tupo and the role that she plays as an intermediary between Tane and Tangaroa. That her role is to mitigate as a wetland between the land and the forest and the seas and the waters. And that there's this eternal pakanga, right, that goes on between Tangaroa who, and the erosion trying to get up to eat the children of Tane and Tane. So there's this constant battle going on. And that's our korero that talks about erosion, climate change, all of those things. It draws on all of it. Why is that important? It's important because Moana Tui Tiripo represents that vital function in terms of treating water that takes place in order to make it acceptable for water to remove between those two realms. So from an ecology point of view, or, or probably actually, you know, from a scientific point of view, we're talking about what must happen for something to be acceptable you must, before you come into my mum's house, take your shoes off. Before the water goes from the realm of me into the realm of Tangaroa, from Pane to Tangaroa, it must pass through Moana Tuki Tiriko in her dignity. Not this manipulated little situation we see transpiring in these constructed wetlands. It's like putting a atua in shackles and then telling you to do her mahi. Especially because the biggest wetland in Opanoni has is no longer operating as a wetland. So I want to say that the answer, the, the reason one of the is essential is because she provides that connection that goes through the whenua which starts to begin to reinstate the modi of that way and remove any paru. And so in that instance, the tapu of the tangata is removed. And that's, a key, that's the key part about dealing with wastewater from a te ao Māori point of view. Because there's a tapu that's associated with us. So when we have waste, it has to go through a process of being rebirthed and being returned so that it can be acceptable to the modi of the way. There's nothing in these systems that currently, as it currently is proposed under this resource consent application that meets that need. Sure. I would like to finish by saying um, that I cannot express how disappointing it was to see the removal of that, of the community liaison groups from that condition, from that consent <coughs> location. It is single-handedly a galvanising, the most galvanising glass off moment that I've had in this journey. I can't <coughs> speak to the applicant, but if I could, I would let them know clearly. Any council that thinks that they have no requirement to make a commitment to having a relationship with hapu and community, e pakanga nui kei te haere. I can't tell you how disappointed we were. But it was a good lesson to learn, and we have learned it. And we won't learn that lesson again. So 
and say that, given that we only saw that change on Monday, I would like to please ask that we would have the opportunity to consider and respond, and it won't take us long, to consider and respond to those things because we prepared our submissions and our speeches for this week in response to the original application that was submitted. We didn't have enough time to go back to our hapu and say, how do we pay that back? And as a community, it was quite distressing. So I hadn't planned on being that quite firm and forthright in this in this court at all. But I feel like it's the only thing that will assuage the disappointment of our community and our hapu because they were fuming. <laughs> so to stop the council and the hearing from having to have 50,000 people, I'm not 50,000, it's a little bit stretch, okay, maybe 50. <laughs> a little bit stretch, bring it from 50,000 back to 50. The opposite to what happened in the chambers and the consent conditions, I know. To save you all from having 50 people venting, I said to them, I'll have a vent for us. That's what I'm doing. So please commit me that tiny bit. Um, otherwise, I'd just like to thank everybody. It wasn't, you said yesterday, thanks for all the work and helping to organise and, and support the community. It wasn't just me. There were many people in this room, here at this table, and dotted around the room, who have collectively worked hard to sit by their aunties and uncles to help them feel brave enough to speak. Um, from that end, all the way through to the food, uh, to the moving off there, you know, exercise classes somewhere else so that we could use the hall. <laughs> These are all really big deals. Yeah. <laughs> big, big deal, that was. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I just want to acknowledge that. It, thank you yesterday for your um, kind words, and I just wanted to share that with the rest of the people in this room who have all really worked hard. And I want to acknowledge especially the elected representatives um, that were here earlier in the week, and Joe, who's here today, and all of our other community board members, and all the other elected representatives, which we don't acknowledge in our whanau, you know, like the elected marae trustees in the room, and that sort of stuff, that's picky money. No bad respect to all them. Okay, cool, thank you. Nō reira tēnā na tātou katoa. Yeah, 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 yeah